Hi everyone. Uh, you have made it to the last lesson in Unit 1 of AP Calc. Um, this is talking about something called the Intermediate Value Theorem. And this is one of the, um, the big theorems in calculus. This is a big important one. It's honestly not that hard conceptually. Um, I think the biggest thing we're going to we're going to have to work on is how do we how do we answer questions using this theorem? How do we justify ourselves using this theorem? But the theorem itself, I think, is going to make a lot of sense to you. So you can see the wording of the theorem here, and you might be looking at that and going, you know, what is she talking about? Um, this doesn't make any sense to me. But I think it'll make sense to you once I draw a picture of what's going on here. So um, if you need to copy down that theorem, you know, go ahead and pause the video so you can do that. But Here's the idea. We're working with a continuous function, and I'm going to make a real big deal about this because this theorem only works if we know that our function is continuous. And so whenever you're going to use this theorem or apply this theorem, remember we talked about having to state the conditions. This is one of the conditions. So you always have to be very clear that, hey, I'm working with a continuous function, so I'm allowed to use this theorem. Um, so let's just say I have a function that does something like, I don't know, something like this. Okay? Um, and we're going to call this endpoint A, and we'll call this endpoint B. And that means that for the y values, I would refer to this y value as f of A. And I would refer to this y value here, we'll just say this is up at the top, um, as f of B. Okay, so if I choose a value m that lives between f of a and f of b, so I just want to point out that when we're talking about this value m, we're talking about a y value. Okay, we're talking about an output value. So if I choose an m somewhere in between these two, so if this is m, what the function tells me is there must be an x value down here between a and b that corresponds with that m. So this m value must live between a and b someplace. Okay. Um, that doesn't sound like a real big deal. Honestly, it probably doesn't sound like it's um, even worth mentioning. But what this is going to allow us to do is that if we can see some output values of a function, we can conclude that every value in between those numbers also falls within that range on the x interval. Okay, um, so I kind of reworded it down here. If a continuous function attains two values, two y values, then it must attain every value in between those if this function is truly continuous. Okay, um, I want to point out what this function does not say. So notice that I started this, um, oh, and then I shouldn't have named this m, I just realized. Up here I called this c. So there must be exist an x value c such that f of c is equal to m. So this is C, and then I would say that F of C is equal to this M value. Okay, so going backwards here, um, this theorem does not work. So for example, if you were to look here and pick anything between A and B and choose a value here, you're not necessarily guaranteed to find something that falls between F of A and F of B. I think that does happen on this particular function that I drew. Um, but let me just give you an example of one where that would not be true. Let's say you had like a piece of a parabola. Okay. Um, so if I had, let's see, A and B here, and I chose like this X value here for my C value, this does not necessarily fall between F of A and F of B. Okay, it can fall underneath there. So we don't know for sure that the function always lives between these values. But we do know for sure that if I pick any y value in between the two endpoints, there must be some x value that coordinates with that. Okay, so let me show you how we're going to use that. Here's example one. Um, it says, consider this function. Prove that there is an x value on the interval 0, 2, such that f of c must equal 1. So this interval is talking about on the x-axis, so that there is some x value between 0 and 2, where when I plug that value in, I'm going to get 1 out as an answer. So the very first thing you're going to do, and this kind of steps you through the process that you're going to use to answer a question like this. It's not always going to tell you to do this, but this is really important. It says verify that this is continuous. Okay. 
So I'm going to look at this function. This is a parabola, right? It's a quadratic. Quadratics and more generally polynomials are always continuous functions, okay? So I would probably start my answer with something like, we know, and you don't have to do any math to verify that really. Um, you just have to look at it and know that that's a continuous function. We know that f of x is continuous, okay? So that's how I'm going to start my answer. Always have to point out the continuity. Honestly, even if it says in the problem, let f of x be a continuous function, we should take a minute to state, like, hey, since we know this is continuous, this is why we're allowed to do what we're about to do. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to find the function value at the two endpoints. So I'm going to find f of 0 and f of 2. Okay, f of 0 would be 0 squared minus 2, so that's what, negative 2. And then f of 2 is 2 squared minus 2, so that's 4 minus 2, so that's 2. Okay, so these are my y values at the two endpoints. So now, for applying the IVT, we're going to say, since the value that we're looking for is 1, and since that's kind of sandwiched in between these two values, I would say, since f of 0 is less than 1, is less than f of 2. Okay, so that's me saying that this value falls between these two values, okay? And I do usually, like if I'm writing this all as one statement, I do take the time to point out that I know what these values are. So since this value falls between f of 0 and f of 2, we know a value c exists. Um, actually, I'm going to... I'm going to condense this a little bit. Um, and I'm going to introduce some notation. I don't know if you've seen this notation in class yet or not. So I'm going to say C. I'm going to use this little symbol here. It looks like a sideways kind of curvy E. And then I'm going to write the interval 0, 2. Okay, and I'll just kind of explain what that means. But this is just me trying to limit how many words I'm having to say here. This says that the value C is in or is included in this interval. So C is somewhere between 0 and 2. This is kind of a mathematical shorthand way to say that. Okay, um, We know a value C on this interval exists such that F of C equals 1. That's how we're using the intermediate value theorem. It feels like way more words than it needs to be, but that's what we have to say to be able to utilize the theorem correctly. So the theorem has two ifs, right? The first if is if the function is continuous, so we have to make sure we say that it's continuous. And if you have a value that falls between these two endpoints, so we have to make sure we say this. And to back this up, we really should show the math that gives me these two values, okay, somewhere along the way. But I have to say this, and I have to say this, and then this is my conclusion, that a value exists on this interval such that f of c equals 1, okay? So those are the pieces of the intermediate value theorem. If this and this, then this. Okay, let's look at what else we've got going on here. Okay, this is one of the most common applications of the IVT. We've got a function here. I'm going to highlight this word here. This thing is continuous. Okay. And we want to know, is this true or false? So the first one is the function has at least three zeros. Okay, so zeros are where y is equal to zero. Okay. So I'm going to look at my f of x's or my y's. And you'll notice, for example, by the way, you did questions like this last year in Algebra 2. This should look familiar. Here I dropped from 1 to negative 5. And since 0 is between 1 and negative 5, we know that somewhere between 0 and 3 on the x-axis, this graph must cross 0. So that's one of our zeros. Okay? Happens again right here. 
negative 5 to 3, we cr must have crossed over 0 because 0 falls in between those two numbers. So we have another 0 between 3 and 4. Okay, And then we go to 7, so we didn't cross over 0 there necessarily. It is possible, I want to point out that it is totally possible um, for you to cross 0 even if you don't see it in the table. Like it's possible that this dropped down to 0 and then hopped back up to 7 before we got to 8 but we, we don't know for sure, okay? And then last one, but from seven to negative one, oh, we cross zero there again. So we must have a zero that lives between eight and nine. So this one I would say is true, okay? We have a zero between zero and three. We have a zero between three and four. We have a zero between eight and nine. Okay, there exists a value x on the interval 0 to 4, so somewhere between 0 and 4, such that f of x equals 2. Okay, if I look at my endpoints on that interval, I'm going from 1 to 3, and since 2 falls between 1 and 3, um, I would say that this is a true statement. And so I'm just going to kind of write this so we understand where this is coming from. Um, we have that f of 0 equals 1, we have that f of 4 equals 3, and since 1 is less than 2 is less than 3, that's what tells us that we must have an x value that goes with that 2. Okay, f of 6 must be between 3 and 7. Okay, so let's look at f of 6. So f of 6 um, would live somewhere here because here's, so the 6 lives between the 4 and the 8, right? 6 is somewhere here. So f of 6 must be down here in this interval, okay? Um, let's see. That would not necessarily have to be true. That's that backwards application of the intermediate value theorem. So it's totally possible that Remember I said it's, it's possible that we could have dropped from 3 down to 0 and then gone back up to 7. So maybe f of 6 is like 0. Um, I'm going to say this is false, and then I'm going to draw you a picture to kind of show you what I mean by that. So if this is my graph here, and here's 3, oh no, sorry, here's 4, and here's 8, we know f of 4 is at 3 just kind of rough sketching a graph here, and f of 8 is at 7. We know that this is the end point, we know that this is the end point, but it's entirely possible that this graph does something like this, or it could go the other way, go up above, okay? And so when I'm at 6, my f of 6 value could be somewhere down here, or it could be somewhere up above 7, so it doesn't necessarily have to live between 3 and 7, that's backwards, right? This idea of saying that at the y value has to be between these two y values, that's not how IVT works. IVT says if you choose a y value in between here, so if I choose a y value between 3 and 7, then there must be some x value that goes along with it. Okay, it's possible that f of 2 is equal to 7. Okay, um, again, so f of 2, the 2 lives somewhere in here right? So we have endpoints of 1 and negative 5, and we might look at that and say, well, 7 doesn't live in between there. But this could be a situation like this one where we start at 1 and hop way up to 7 before dropping back down to negative 5, okay? So this is a backwards application of IVT, and it doesn't work that way. Again, the only way IVT works is if you have a, um, if you choose a y value, you can say that's between these two, then you know that an x value must exist. So I would say this is possible, okay? It might look counterintuitive to you, but it is possible that this, these numbers could jump up to 7 and then fall back down to negative 5. And then the maximum value of this function is 7. Well, I see a 7 here, and that is definitely the biggest number I see as y values, but we don't know for sure that we don't have bigger numbers in between. We're only seeing, like, select values here. This thing is continuous, which means there's values in between all of these numbers. We have no way of knowing if this thing goes higher than 7 at some point. So it, I'm going to say false, and I just want to make it clear that it could be 
but it's also possible that there's something higher out there. So could be, but we don't know for sure. Okay. Okay. So now let's look at some more justifications here with the IVT. Um, show that this function has a zero on the interval zero one. Okay. So if we're looking at an interval, um, the very first thing I'm going to do, well, and I guess this question doesn't say that we have to justify, so we could probably be less formal, but I do think it's important to get in this habit of just pointing out that, hey, this function is continuous. Okay. Um, so I'm going to look at f of 0 and f of 1. Okay. So f of 0 would be 0 cubed plus 2 times 0, so that whole thing is just going to work out to be negative 1. f of 1 is going to be 1 cubed, so that's 1 plus 2, so that's 3, and then 3 minus 1 is 2. Okay, so the 0 comes from a y value that is 0, and the y value of 0 lives between these two values, right? So since negative 1 is less than 0 is less than 2, which we could also say as since f of 0 is less than 0 is less than f of 1. So I can name them with these numbers, I can name them with these numbers. Since this number lives between these two function values, by the IVT, we know that a 0 exists on this interval. We know that the, there is an x value where this happens between 0 and 1. Okay, that's what the IVT says. Again, that one's not written up super formally because it didn't say I had to write a justification. Okay, is there a solution to this thing between x equals 0 and x equals 2? And I just want to point out solution. They're looking for a solution when this thing is equal to 0. So essentially, they're asking the same thing as up here. They want to know, does this thing have a 0 on this interval? So um, first thing again, this is a polynomial function. So... Let's just verify this thing is continuous. Okay. And so I'm going to find f of 0, and I'm going to find f of 2. Okay. If I put in 0, I get 0 and 0 minus 2, so this whole thing becomes a negative 2. If I put in a 2, all right, watch my mental math here. So this is 32. And then 2 cubed is 8, but then I'm multiplying by negative 2, so that's 16. So 32 minus 16 is 16, and then 16 minus 2 is 14. Okay? So this number does live between these two values. So I would say yes, since, and I probably should say that, yes, yeah, since this function is continuous, because otherwise my whole theorem falls apart. And um, f of 0 is less than 0 is less than f of 2. Okay, which is a fancy way of saying that 0 lives between negative 2 and 14. We know um, a value C on the interval 0, 2 exists such that F of C equals 0. That's what one of these justifications should look like. So you've got your two ifs. You've got this statement and you've got this statement. Those are the two pieces of the theorem. And then this is what it lets us conclude, that a value exists on the interval such that f of c equals whatever number. We chose 0 because this was looking for a 0. Okay? So that's what your statement should look like for these. Give me the if, give me the if, give me the then. Okay? Okay. Um, you're going to try some of these tonight. Hopefully they go well for you. If you do have questions, of course, as always, feel free to ask.